The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. On today's show, we explore the world of ethanol. This fuel has a long history and a very exciting present. We talk with farmers, ethanol producers, and then we head to the racetrack to get in on some fast action by some of the users of ethanol. It's going to be a high-octane show. Stick around. Farm Connections is next. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections on KSMQ is brought to you in part by Primrose Retirement Communities in Austin and Mankato. Primrose, a provider of independent and assisted living, is a proud sponsor of Farm Connections. Primrose, this is living. Task AgriPlan Now is an employee benefit program that enables family farmers to take federal, state, and self-employment tax deductions on health insurance premiums and out-of-pocket expenses. AgriPlan Now is a proud partner of Farm Connections. Will Mahler, the Ag Attorney, has been representing dairy farms in Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin for more than 38 years. Will Mahler, the Ag Attorney's office is in Rochester, and Will, a proud partner of Farm Connections. Thanks, Will Mahler. Ethanol is a multi-billion dollar industry in Minnesota and Iowa. It is important to farmers, consumers, our environment, communities, state budgets, and to thousands of employees in the industry. To help this homegrown industry expand, Minnesota has been offering various incentives and requirements to encourage the use of ethanol blends in our fuel supply. In Minnesota, the renewable fuels industry supports 48,506 jobs with wages totaling $3 billion. State and federal taxes paid by the industry in Minnesota amounts to $1.1 billion. Iowa leads the nation in ethanol production, creating nearly 30% of all ethanol accounting for 55,000 jobs and more than five billion of Iowa's GDP. It's clear that ethanol is pretty important. But let's move from the facts to the field. I recently visited with Rick Schwark, CEO of Absolute Energy, to find out more. Farm Connections at Lyle and Mona, Iowa with Rick from Absolute Energy. Thanks, Dan. Well, it's great to be here and thanks for the invitation. What happens here? We make ethanol. We take corn and we make ethanol, distillers grains, corn oil, and other valuable farm ag products. How many people work here? We have uh, 44 full-time employees and two part-time employees here at Absolute Energy. How do wages compare here to other industries? Well, I appreciate that question. You know, in a recent survey, uh, they listed the top income uh, producing colleges, and Harvard stuck out as number five, and the average, uh, uh, the average student after five years earns 55,000 per year our average employee will make more than that. And that's in the Midwest where the cost of living might be different than... That's right. A fifth, it probably goes a little farther here than it does in Boston. That's tremendous. So you must have been um, accepted very quickly as an industry and a welcome neighbor. Oh yeah, we're, we're, a, you know, we're a good neighbor. We try very hard to be a good neighbor. We actively work at that, not just here, but within the community. What does it mean locally and how many people benefit from this plant? Well, we're very proud of our local ownership. Uh, we, ha we have one of the largest percentages of, of local farm ownership of, of uh, ethanol plants in the country. Um, over 90% of our members live within 50 miles of this facility, right where we're standing. So these, this economic impact is not just affecting the farmers, but also those local members who receive distributions from the, the economic in income from Absolute Energy you know, on an annual basis. And then it, this year, it's been quite a bit. Distribution is considered a value added to the corn they sell? No. For us, we are an LLC. We, 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 we buy corn on the, on the market, but their ownership is not tied to a bushel. So it's actually just whatever profit we make goes back to the members in, in their units on, of ownership. Well, we've spent some time with race drivers that burn your fuel, farmers that produce it. How do you fit into that whole thing of making a fuel that we can burn today? Well, we receive about 44 million bushels per year you know, from the area farmers, and we produce that into ethanol, CO2, and uh, distiller's grains. And distiller's grains, we, all we do is we take the starch from the kernel, and that component goes into the ethanol. But all the protein, the oil, the minerals, micronutrients, and fiber remains in the, in the high quality distiller's grains and becomes a very uh, valuable livestock feed. Dried distiller's grains? Dried distiller's grains, yes. 
Wh where's the market for that? Is it locally? Is it beyond that? We sell a, a lot locally, uh, but we also ship a lot in export. Uh, we send a lot to China, uh, but nearly probably 80% of our product uh, actually ends up going to China because they need the protein. Uh, and they take our protein and they rehydrate it with their locally produced starches for the added energy to feed to primarily their swine industry. Well, if that much of the corn is actually getting exported and used in the livestock industry, without this plant, we must have some issues with supply and demand. Oh, yes, yes. And, you know, uh, our exports of these distillers grains obviously helps our balance of trade as a nation. Uh, and and uh, nearly 22% of the distillers grains that are produced in the United States are exported to China. Well, I read some of your literature, Rick, and it seems like you're really, really bullish about homegrown fuels and homegrown jobs. Can you expand on that? Why is that important for Minnesota and Iowa? Well, you know, one of the things when we started this became apparent that if our children were going to have the opportunities that, that we have and our grandchildren, the one thing that we cannot do is send $400 billion per year out of our economy to foreign oil, to foreign countries that don't like us very much. So, uh, you know, this value-added, homegrown, bringing those dollars you know, back to the Midwest, creating these opportunities, it was very important. And, it, and it's good for the health of the nation, not just good for the air. Well, as I walked through the office, I saw some young people are working here that might have been in a larger metro area rather than rural Minnesota or rural Iowa if it wasn't for you. Yes, and there's, there's a lot of that. Uh, we, we have many examples, but just our plant manager, for example, he was a supervisor. His family lived in Northwood, Iowa, but he had to commute to Minneapolis. He'd been, he had an apartment up there. He was a supervisor for many years and now was able to come back home and get a great job right here, you know, 15 miles instead of, you know, all the way up to the cities. Rick, you mentioned the 1970s as the era when the modern ethanol industry started. But really, ethanol and, and fuels go back further than that. Any thoughts on that? Well, the Model T, the first Model T, was actually designed to build on ethanol. And it, and it ran very well out of those first cars. But uh, the oil industry discovered oil, and, and there was competition for them. And so they were big proponents of, of prohibition. And prohibition just didn't kill drinking alcohol. It killed alcohol for motor vehicles as well. So it was, you know, we. We, we face competition today also uh, uh, from the oil industry, a little while different. Um, you know, it's, it's a fight for market share. You also mentioned environment. And ethanol is a, a fairly environmentally friendly product until something's added to it to denature it. Why, why is that done? Well, it's, it's ironic that, that we take a biodegradable product of ethanol and we have to add a poison to it so you can't drink it. And that's really because it is, um, it is not a poison and you could you know, drink it. It's the same alcohol as you have in, in your alcoholic beverages that you drink. Uh, so in order to make sure that it isn't consumed in that manner, we have to add a denaturant to it so it makes it unpalatable. Which in this case is usually gasoline, right? It's a natural gasoline, yes. Rick, how does ethanol fit into the modern engineering of the new engines that are coming out? Well, it's an extremely com uh, important component of the, as the fuel that's going to go into the engines of the future. The engines of the future are going to be lower cubic inch, direct injected, turbocharged, higher compression engines. But if you're going to do that, you have to have a high octane fuel to make that happen. So it's really important as we come to the 54 mile per gallon CAFE standards, you, you can't do it without these higher octane fuels. Well, when I f pull into the filling station to get fuels, I noticed different octane ratings. Can you expand on that some? What does that mean? Well, you have E10, E15, E30, E85. Generally, that means it's 10% ethanol, 20% ethanol, 30% ethanol. Uh, and so as you're adding these, assuming your, your base stock doesn't change, your octane level goes up. And octane means so your engine doesn't knock, OK? Uh, years ago, we had lead in our fuel to keep that, and which is a very nasty thing in our environment and we've replaced that with ethanol which is a cleaner greener you know much better burning fuel you know tailpipe emissions when you just put in just 10 percent go down 65 percent with the addition of that so you know it's a, it's a very important component to our clean air so as I add octane to my fuel tank into my car or my automobile I'm actually in increasing the performance and what it can do in the engine? You're, you're increasing the potential for performance. Now you have to engineer the engine to take advantage of that potential. 
A lot of engines, the old engines, are not optimized. The new engines will be optimized and will get you know, equal to or better than mileage than, than you know, the standard engines when optimized. Now that we've learned a little about how ethanol fits into our local economies, let's head out to the racetrack to talk to some folks using ethanol for a little fun. John, thanks, yeah. for, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Well, what is the event today and why are you so pumped up? It's a free admission at the racetrack sponsored by the Minnesota Corn Growers, uh, Tasseldega Nights. Um, support ethanol and, and to inform everybody of ethanol as a fuel as well as a race fuel, uh, which I use it for. How long have you been racing? I've been racing since I've been 15, so uh, it's, been, it's a while. I, not, to, not to age myself. Um, I've been running ethanol for all but one of those years. It's a great race fuel and I love it. What's different about ethanol from the other fuels? Well, number one, uh, as a racer personally, it's more cost effective, it's cheaper. Um, number two, it uh, helps the engine run much, much cooler. So on a hot night, you know, such as tonight, when it gets late in the evening, as the engine gets hot, mine stays cool and stays strong with horsepower. You mentioned the dollar difference in cost. What's, what is uh, ethanol fuel compared to? Roughly today, uh, it's probably about $4 a gallon for my ethanol, which is E98 race fuel, compared to the most race fuels that are, you know, $8.50 currently for 110 wow. octane. So nearly double or about double? Yeah, double if not more. Well, I picked these jars off from your car, yep. and there seems to be some difference between them. Why are they on your car, and what, what's in these jars? All right, um, if I may, this here is uh, the E98 that I run. Um, it would be completely clear if it wasn't having that 2% gas in there. Um, it's required to be denatured or people would drink it because it's literally moonshine. Uh, this purple one is a race fuel which is 110 octane that most people run. Um, and I like to demonstrate these have been in the jars for the same amount of time. And if you can see all the settlements in the bottom of this one, there's absolutely none in the ethanol. Right. It just shows how clean of a fuel this is in comparison to the petroleum based fuel. What happens when this runs through your engine? It builds up on your valves and ultimately makes everything move a little bit slower and you lose horsepower. How many horsepower in that engine? You know, to be exact, I don't know. I've never dynoed this motor with this carburetor. Um, the last time it was dynoed with just a carburetor is about a 420 horse. You've been racing all across southern Minnesota or across the state. Where's your zone? I primarily stay around central Minnesota, so Sauk Rapids, Wilmer, Madison, Alexandria. But I've raced down as far as West Burlington, Iowa, which is an IMCA track. And what's the most fun you've had racing so far? The most fun would be spending time with my, my family. Um, my, my brother races as well, and my dad's my pit crew. Um, so from us being from a small town, it's something that we just love to do together. Dad helps in the pit crew, is that what you said? Yep. And did he race also? Yes, he did. He raced prior to me coming to this world, and uh, when I got 15, I decided I'm gonna build a race car. So tell me about the build design of that car. Uh, my car is an old floor chassis, um, so it's a little bit older, but I like how it works, so why change? Um, as far as the, it's just sheet metal around a steel frame, and it's a, it's a Midwest modified and it was sort of sanctioned. Um, I chose that class because a lot of people were skeptical that you could not run a, a 350 with a cast iron intake and run ethanol. I basically did this to prove them wrong. And, and the results? The results are wonderful. Um, I generally finish in the top five, wow. you know, in my local tracks. When I go to different venues, you know, it's a little tough to get used to the track, but, you know, it still worked well for me. What do you do on the day job when you're not racing cars? I, I'm actually an accountant, believe it or not. So I sit behind a desk, um, but I work a lot in the renewable fuels industry, a lot with ethanol and biodiesel plants. Um, so, you know, to support that and, and myself, I have a lot of ethanol clients, the plants themselves, that sponsor me to help promote ethanol. Um, my race car has corn cobs on the side, my number's US ethanol. So it just draws awareness that, hey, this car runs on ethanol. 
Well, as I'm watching all the people come in and there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for this regional business, this statewide business, anywhere where there's corn grown to, to, to grow this fuel, why is that important for our local economies? It's very important. If you talk to any of the local farmers that actually produce grain, corn that goes to these ethanol plants, that's a huge income to them. You know, they don't have to ship their grain overseas or to southern countries or to southern states where they have poor grain you know, crops for that year. It just goes right to the local and there's always a demand for it. So that just brings money right to our local farmers. You know, and, it and I take pride in the fact that the field right down the road from my house that corn grown there literally fuels my race car because my ethanol comes from a plant 30 miles from my house. That's local. That's local as you can get, I believe. <laughs> well, good luck in the race tonight. Why, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Coming up next, we'll talk with some of the corn producers who make events like Tassel Dagan Nights and the production of ethanol possible. Good to see you. You too, Dan. Well, Glad all, to be here. This is an amazing event here. I see thousands of people, and I see cars, and I see farmers, and I see people from the local community. What's happening today? Well, the corn growers are proud to be sponsors of Tesseldega Nights tonight in Deer Creek Speedway. The partnership that we have with the Queensland family is, is fantastic. We can get our message out on the benefits of ethanol to our urban people that may be a little skeptical about ethanol and they see cars out here running on a higher blend of ethanol and they'll go back home and say, well, if they can do it, I can do it. How many ethanol plants are there in Minnesota? 20. 20? 20, 20 uh, with a, a billion gallons a year. One billion gallons. One billion gallons. And that doesn't count the ones just across the borders? No. Now, keep in mind that uh, that a third of that product, once that corn goes into the ethanol plant, a third of it's left over as a high protein food for livestock. So it's not all used, it's only the starch used for the ethanol, it's not all gone. So the third of it's left over. DDGs or? Dry. DDGs, there, is that, thank you, yes. Dry distillers grains? Dry di distillers grains, correct. So we've got a third of it left for feed. And you know, some people do ask that question, Jerry, is why are you burning up my food? What's happening in farm country this year? Well, um, as you know, 2012 was a drought. Anytime you have weather-related situations that we can't control, 2012 was a drought that reduced the supply of corn for that year. Now we're into 14. Uh, just got back from Corn Congress out in Washington, D.C. on Thursday night. That's all the corn growing states. Illinois is sitting with a good crop. Missouri is sitting with a good crop. Bottom line is this, corn farmers will step up to the plate and produce, a, if we have the good weather, we'll produce. So far what they're saying is we're, we got a record crop coming. We'll keep up the good work, Jerry. Thanks, Dan. Hi, Adam. Nice to see you, Dan. Nice to see you. There seems to be a lot of excitement at the racetrack tonight. What's happening? It's packed full of stuff. We've got the Minnesota Corn Growers Association booth where we're selling t-shirts, we're giving away American ethanol flags, we're giving away Maisie dolls, we're bringing people the facts about ethanol, if they have questions about ethanol, where it comes from, can they use it in their vehicle, we'll answer them. We also have uh, the Biofuels Mobile Education Centers here. That's a 45 foot long trailer that travels throughout the entire country with a positive message about ethanol. They're connecting with consumers, they're connecting with kids, they're connecting with drivers all over the entire country. We've got the uh, Ag Cab Lab Simulator, and that's also really cool. It's pretty much a, a giant simulated tractor slash combine, so if kids want to climb in, they can uh, pretend to plant some corn or har harvest some soybeans, things like that. We also have Jonathan Olmscheid with his uh, ethanol race vehicle here and all kinds of other fun games and uh, music and magic and uh, of course racing here tonight at uh, Tassel Digga Nights at the uh, Deer Creek Speedway. You mentioned answering questions that consumers and, and perhaps farmers have. What kind of questions do you get? They run the gamut from uh, what is ethanol and usually the, the, the what is ethanol questions come from younger drivers. If you think about it, there's probably an entire generation of drivers out there 
that haven't heard much about ethanol. They're not aware that it's blended in 10% in in of our fuel supply. They're not quite sure what E85 is or if they can use it in their car. Um, and then from some, some more experienced drivers or consumers we hear, is it safe for my engine? Um, where does it come from? Is it good for the environment? So we answer those, those types of questions. And then from, uh, from fellow farmers, we get questions like, how does it help corn farmers? Um, how does it impact the price of feed? How does it impact uh, food prices at the uh, grocery store? What do you guys do to uh, promote a positive image for ethanol? So all those tend to come at us from different directions, and that's why we come to events like this. It's to answer those questions and uh, connect with both consumers and uh, fellow farmers about ethanol. So you're trying to be available to help people understand your industry. Yeah, it's a it's 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 kind of two parts. It's getting a our message out there so people understand the facts about ethanol, and they're getting it straight from farmers and the people that produce it and the people that use it, and not some uh, some organization that, that 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 might be against it, and and also answer their questions because people have questions whether they are familiar with the product or not, and they have questions about ethanol, whether it's this basic what is it, or maybe more in depth. Uh, how is it going to work with my engine? And we're, we're here to answer that. Well, one of the most basic questions that I heard you talk about was, what's ethanol? Can, can you tell me what it is? What's ethanol? Well, it's a cleaner burning, homegrown, renewable fuel. It's made from corn. It's grown right here in Minnesota, in Minnesota cornfields and cornfields throughout the entire country. Um, it, uh, it, it burns cleaner. It, it provides more, um, more power in engines. It's, it's, it's higher octane. And uh, consumer-wise, it's quite often uh, usually a price lower at the pump, so consumers can save money. They uh, support the, the the local economy right here in Minnesota by using ethanol, and they're they're running a uh, cleaner burning fuel that cleans our air. Well, I remember my dad talking about Model Ts and, and Ford products being operated on ethanol many years ago. Yep, Henry Ford built a Model T to run on ethanol, and uh, Mercedes-Benz also called ethanol the uh, best kept secret in all of the auto industry. So. It's, uh, it's got a, a long and storied history of being a, a, a quality fuel, a, 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 a more affordable fuel for consumers. And, it's, and like I said before, it's, it's, it's blended in 10% uh, of, of all of our fuel supply. And also here in, in, in Minnesota, that's expanding a bit. We have some stations now that uh, dispense E15, which is a 15% blend. And of course, we have about oh, right around 400 stations that have E85, which is 85% ethanol and 15% uh, regular gasoline. What kind of impact does it have on Minnesota? Very positive. It, uh, it really helps the, the rural communities. Um, uh, there's 20 ethanol plants throughout our state, and they provide about 13,000 jobs directly. And then that kind of ties back into the ag industry, which is the, uh, the, the second biggest sector of the, the Minnesota economy. And that provides about right around 400,000 jobs throughout our entire state. So all of that ripples throughout. Um, you know, if, if the farming community is, is, is doing well, that ripples throughout the entire rural community and also throughout the entire state. But then, you know, perhaps most importantly, um, Minnesota decided to blend 10% ethanol in all of our fuel back in 1997. And they did that because the air quality in the Twin Cities was so low that we, that we weren't meeting EPA standards. Well. We started to blend that 10% ethanol into our uh, fuel supply and voila, now we're meeting the EPA standards, the air is cleaner and uh, there's a more affordable, uh, cleaner burning choice at the pump. 13,000 jobs, any idea how much impact that has on our state with uh, income tax, real estate tax and other things? You know, I don't have the, the direct numbers off the top of my head, but it's significant. I mean, if, if, if you go into a rural area with a, uh, a, an, an ethanol plant nearby, there's, there's trucks coming and going, there's farmers bringing their, their corn to the plant, there's activity at the local cafes, the local implement dealer is busy selling equipment, the hardware store is busy selling uh, supplies to farmers and to uh, people in the, uh, the ag sector. So. Without having the, uh, the direct numbers in front of me, I can tell you, go to a small town near an ethanol plant, you'll see a lot of activity. Well, this looks like a great event tonight, and thanks for sponsoring it and letting us hey, attend. Thanks for coming, Dan. You bet. Up next, let's visit with the Student Leader of the Week. Yes, I grew up on a smaller farm. It is a little shy of 300 acres, uh, crop production, corn and soybeans, with a smaller feedlot that my dad and I managed together. Yeah, you know, you really have different experiences and I mean there's times where you know when I was younger obviously you'd maybe hold a wrench or something and as you grew up you know the work continued to eventually driving that tractor you know driving vital machinery around and things like that but right now I'm actually the sole 
a manager of the feedlot and I own my own beef lot, you know, in hopes of taking over the family farm, you know, after I return home from college. Right now I'm the fourth generation of our family farm, so I mean, I'm the only son that's really willing to take it on and I think that hopefully once I graduate from college that I'll be able to come back and be able to continue that legacy. You know, it's pretty much everything you just said. I mean, you go from, some people might say, oh, you know, farmers kind of get lazy sometimes, or, you know, it's kind of laid back, but it's like the hours you have to spend, I mean, you're dedicating your whole life to just get maybe what's the average 40 seasons to grow a crop, you know, 40 different crops, and that's about it on average. So, I mean, you, you have the responsibility to get the best you can get out of each year, but at the same time, you know, be able to truly care about what you're doing so that you don't mess up, you know, it's what you're doing for yourself and for others. Well, the one I, that I really did, I did partake in the CD, uh, agronomy CD, just this last fall that I went to the national convention for it. Our team had one region, we had one state, you know, we had the chance to go on to the national level. And I mean, it was really exciting. I mean, the energy that flowed from that building, you know, a chance to compete and rank yourself against, you know, 50 other states plus the Puerto Rico. and. I mean, just those, all those states and see where you truly ranked. And it, you know, is a blessing to come out of there as a 13th place team and then myself in the top 10 individuals. So that was a very memorable moment for myself. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Farm Connections. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Join us next time on Farm Connections. <music>